You're not called to live a busted up life in depression and oppression and to be miserable. You're called to live in victory. And Jesus gives us the anointing so that we can live in victory. The Bible describes the presence of God as the anointing. I know that word is not used a lot in certain churches, certain denominations. And they'll come around to a church like this and, and they'll hear anointing this, anointing that, anointing this, anointing that. What, what is that? And it's another way to describe the Holy Spirit or the presence of God. Get that in, voc in your vocabulary, the anointing, the anointing. We talk about the anointing a lot around here. Why? Because it was the very theme of Jesus' ministry while he was on the earth. He opened with this theme of the Spirit of the Lord, which is the anointing upon an individual. And before he went back to heaven, he said, do not leave Jerusalem until what? You're endued with power from on high. He began to refer to the Holy Spirit that would come upon them, and baptize them, and they would, be, they would have power to what? To be witnesses on the earth. Now, I want to read to you how Jesus began his ministry in Luke chapter 4. We're just jumping right into this. Is that okay? Amen. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is speaking, and, and he, he's in the synagogue, and this is where he's beginning his earthly ministry. And he, he says this phrase, and he's actually quoting from Isaiah. He gets the scroll, he gets the book of, of Isaiah, and he opens up to this place, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Or I like to say it this way, the Spirit of the Lord is up on me, is upon me. This is, this is the very first words that Jesus says and preaches when he begins his ministry. And if you want to do something great for God, you have to understand that you cannot do it alone, that you have to do it with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the Lord is the key to this kind of life. The Spirit of the Lord upon you is the key to a victorious life. And so Jesus opens up with the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, why is he upon me? That's a good question. He says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. Why? To anoint you. Why? To send you. Amen. Amen. When you look at Jesus, we are called to model his life. You are called to be like Jesus. Can I say it this way? We are called to be like God. You're not called to live a busted up life in depression and oppression and to be miserable. You're called to live in victory. And Jesus gives us the anointing so that we can live in victory. And as you are allowing God to repair your life, your broken heart, guess what? You can then turn around because you've stepped into a place of authority in that realm and you can help deliver others that are living in darkness, others that are living broken and busted up lives. But the enemy wants to keep people, the enemy wants to keep Christians bound up. And we're going to talk about that today. Because I believe that God wants people in this place, the people of God, to decouple from some things that have held them back. And we're going to deal with some of that today. But look at what the anointing does. It says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim this is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now is the time. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so the anointing does lots of things. The anointing, I find, actually 
annoys people with a religious spirit. And if you don't know it by now, we're a church that we go after religion. Because religion actually keeps people in bondage. We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But I find that the anointing of God will actually annoy people. They, they were annoyed when Jesus began to speak this way. Jesus stepped into a place of spiritual authority. And guess what? As soon as he began to open up his mouth and declare what God was doing in and through him, they took him and they brought him to the bow of the city to throw him off of a cliff. People with religious spirits, they hate the anointing. When we were down at Youth Fire Week in Tampa, Florida, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit began to break out in the meetings. It's awesome when you see several thousand young people screaming and laughing because of the presence of God. It was awesome. But all of a sudden, a pastor stood up with his youth group and said, come on. And they all stood up, the whole youth group, the pastor, and he left the room. He walked way out to the back, and we, we all saw him. He was making a statement. I don't want to have anything to do with this Holy Spirit business. Thank God for the wisdom of Rodney Howard Brown. He stepped right up and began to point that out. You know, there's kids today, suicide is at an astronomical rate. Kids are dying left and right through fentanyl use. 100,000 young people are dying every year because of fentanyl. Kids are transitioning. They're so confused today because of these indoctrination camps in schools and universities, which is just all pollution. Kids are, are, are transitioning at a very early age. What do you think they need? Religion? You think they need more tradition? No. What do they need? They need the real thing. Amen. They need the power of God. Amen. And so the anointing will do lots of things. The anointing will fix broken hearts. The anointing will fix broken lives. It can fix broken mindsets, broken marriages. I'm telling you, what God can do in five minutes with you just being rocked by God in his presence. A 20 years worth of counseling can't do what God can do in five minutes. You need the anointing. The anointing will cause you to step out of what you've been in. It'll cause you to step out of darkness and into the light. Yeah. It'll cause you to come out of things that have held you back and in bondage and step into freedom. Yeah. Right. You need the anointing of God, and you'll, it'll make you rich. I mean, here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here. Right. Amen. 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 A couple weeks back, probably three weeks ago now, I began to preach from, from Acts chapter 3, and I want to go there to, to sort of set this up. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. And as I shared on that Wednesday night, you know, for about two and a half years, I've been ministering off and on from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, and I feel in my spirit it's time to move on. And so we're going to Acts chapter 3. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 3. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, 
expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Say that with me. Walking, leaping, and praising God. He had an encounter with the anointing of God in that moment. And it set him free. Today I want to highlight some things that, that I see in the lives of Christians that cause Christians like this, this lame man, causes them to become lame. I mean, think about this man. He had lame feet. He could not move. He could not go forward. He couldn't go anywhere in life without the assistance of other people. And so, in essence, this man, he was a taker. He, he could not contribute to society. He wasn't a giver in any way, shape, or form. He was a taker. And so, he was immobile. He could not move forward in life. You could say that he was stuck. He was lame. And I find that there are Christians that get lame in life, and I don't mean in the modern sense of, oh, that's lame. I mean that they can't move forward in life because they've partnered with some attitudes. They've allowed some things to fester in their heart. They have some mindsets that they have partnered with. And in some cases, they have even partnered with spirits. And so they cannot move forward at all in life. They are, in essence, lame Christians. They can't, they can't really do anything for God. They're stuck. They're paralyzed. And so I want to highlight some of those things because I believe that God is, is wanting to set people free in this place, that you could be free to run the race. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so let's begin with this. Daily, they brought this man to the temple. The temple represents religion. This man daily, he was being brought to religion, to the temple. And he could not get what he needed. Maybe he, he could have gotten a couple bucks to eat that day. But what did he really need? He needed a miracle. He needed a healing. And religion offers no hope. Are you with me? In religion, everything is placed on the other side of life. Your healing, it's on the other side of life. Your breakthrough, it's on the other side of life. Your victory, it's on the other side of life. Deliverance is on the other side of life. The blessing of God, it's on the other side of life. And so religion and tradition offers no hope. But over the years, I've seen people grab a hold of religion and tradition, and they hold on to it. Kenneth Hagin said that some people would rather give up Jesus than tradition. This is the way that we've always done things. Yeah, but where has it gotten you? <laughs> where, where's the fruit? Is it good or bad? The thing about religion and tradition is that religion and tradition, it makes the word of God of no effect in your life. Jesus told that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, you have made the word of God of no effect because of your traditions. I've been in churches where they open up the service, the Sunday morning service, with who is sick, who has cancer. So-and-so, they have to cut off their leg, they have gangrene. 
and so and so has stage four cancer. The doctor said there's no hope. And then, of course, they go into that traditional prayer of God, if it be thy will, if you can. God never moves in those services. Do you know how they do crusades in Africa and India? They preach the miracles found in the Bible, and all of a sudden, it begins to build faith until all of a sudden, miracles and healings start taking place like popcorn. Then they grab that person, bring them up on the stage. I know one guy, he said he was in Africa, and a lady had breast cancer. She had her breasts removed, and in this part of Africa, the women didn't cover up. Well, right there in the crusade, her breasts just grew out. They brought her on stage. And she testified, and everybody could see what the Lord had done. What do you think that did in the atmosphere, in that crusade? All of a sudden, miracles started breaking out. It's time to, to, to do a walk away. How many of you have heard of Brexit, where Britain, they, they, they walked away from the European Union? Brexit, they exited. Some folks in here... You need to come out of religion. Amen. You need to come out of tradition. And today's the day. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Religion keeps people lame. And sometimes I see young Christians that get on fire for God. And then the seasoned Christians will come alongside and help condition them to religion. You know, we all get a little excited at the beginning. You know, then after a while, it just kind of wanes. And No. You can keep your tradition. You can keep your lackluster Christian life. I want, I want everything. <laughs> Be careful who you allow come and talk you out of the things of God, which we're going to get into in just a little bit. You guys ever seen the elephants in the circus? You ever see them in the back when they're, they're tied up to a stake? I and mean, we're talking about a 14,000-pound animal that's just tied to a stake. There's a rope and a stake. Think about that, 14,000 pounds. And you're thinking, how in the world can this beast of an animal just be tied up to this stake and not move, not break loose? Well, it's been conditioned that way. From the time it was a child elephant, they tied it up to something that was a little bit heavier than that little elephant. And of course, at first, that elephant would, would fight it. It would fight it. But after a little while, it just gave up. It was conditioned to just yield, to not move, to be chained up. And I find people are like that. They've been conditioned by the devil, by religion, by tradition. God wants to break those chains today. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. One of the things that I see people get paralyzed in is when God begins to bless them and they come into a place of, of wealth and increase and success, that all of a sudden it's like it, it, it paralyzes people. Now, don't get me wrong, we preach prosperity here. I believe in prosperity because it's found all throughout the Word of God, not because it's my opinion. I mean, the Bible literally says in the book of Acts that everyone in the church, like, no one had lack. No one had a need in church. I believe in prosperity. When you go and you read in Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 8 and 9, you find the heart of God the Father. He is so bent on blessing his children. His desire was to bring them to a land filled with milk and honey. 
I mean, he had nothing but the best that he wanted to give his children. And so we don't have a problem with prosperity. I don't have a problem. I'm not going to limit anybody. If God blesses you with three, four, five homes, look, look, that's between you and the Lord. Amen. Amen. Got a little quiet there. Some of you are like, well, I don't know. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless everybody. When you read the book of Acts, you find that the Holy Spirit filled everybody in the upper room. You find that all were blessed in the New Testament. Amen. So it's for everybody. Even ministers. Sometimes people want to limit, well, you know, the people, they, they can have the blessing, but fivefold ministry gifts, well, we're going to mark, we're going to limit you. Really? That's interesting. But I find in the scriptures that when God blesses his people, he also gives a warning. He says, be careful when you find yourself in the land of blessing and you're eating the good of land, of the land, that, that you don't forget the Lord. Be careful when you begin to enjoy a measure of success and wealth and the blessing of God that you don't forget the Lord who gave you that wealth. In fact, in Deuteronomy 8, the Lord says, be careful that you don't say in your heart, I made this happen. Because God gives you the power to create wealth. That ability that you have to create wealth, to make money the way that you do, that comes from the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And sometimes wealth is a test. The Lord will test us with wealth. How many of you know the Lord tests us? Yeah. He'll test you just like a father tests his children, just like a pastor tests his disciples. Yeah. God tests the hearts of men, to see what's in there. I knew a gentleman years ago who was actually a great blessing to us, and he was on fire for God. And he told the story of how God had gotten a hold of him. And he started coming to church, he got saved, and he started his business. He lived in an old trailer, he had an old car, and he'd put all of his tools in the back of his trunk in the car. Imagine showing up on the, the job here. I'm here to build your house. And you got your tools out your, your old Toyota Camry. You got to hit the trunk for it to open, you know. But he began to work really hard, and he began to sew. God began to bless his socks. I mean, he got to the place. He built a fine home, a great business. They would sow tens of thousands in, into missions and, and missionaries. But then all of a sudden, you know, when you're early on in your walk with the Lord, you're, you're running after God, you're hot for God, as we say. You know, he, he was pursuing God. And Lord, give me the blessing. And God, God gives the blessing. But all of a sudden, it's like the blessing got so big, so large, that it began to eclipse the Lord. And it became an idol in his life. And all of a sudden, it's like it, it paralyzed him. And when the pastor would refer to this gentleman, hey, you remember back in the day when you lived in the trailer? And all of a sudden, he just, don't talk about that. Oh, you forgot where you came from? He had pride in his heart. And he got paralyzed. And eventually, it took him right out of church. You know, because when you get wealth, all of a sudden, you've got some dignity now. You've got a reputation you've got to uphold. And then pretty soon, the blessing takes the place of the blesser. Be careful that wealth, success, doesn't block you from going forward in God. Amen. Amen. 
Another thing that I've seen over the years is people will get offended. Offense is nothing to play with. People will become offended with the church. And they'll go to knock it on the church, which is, by the way, the bride of Christ. Amen. So be careful. But people will get offended with, with other believers. Well, I'm not going to that church. It's a bunch of hypocrites. You ever heard somebody say that? How many of you know the Lord's working on everybody? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And people will get offended with, with pastors, you know. I just felt in my spirit just to say, take it easy on pastors. There's 18,000 pastors that quit the ministry every single year. Believe me, they're going to have their day before the Lord where they're going to stand in judgment. They're going to have to give an account. But I learned from Jonathan Shuttlesworth over the years. He said, be careful. Never put your, your mouth on another man's ministry. I'm just thinking about stats. Nine out of ten pastors that set out into ministry, by the time they're 65, nine out of ten are out of ministry. Many of them, they fall due to immorality, burnout, and contention in the church. God doesn't set you in the church to make it hard for the pastor. The Bible says to submit to your spiritual leaders, yeah. not make it difficult for them. Right. Yeah. Years ago, I remember, this was probably 12 years ago, we had a home meeting, and we were back in the States during that time. That was between Malaysia and Cambodia, so maybe it was about 13 years ago. And we were, we were doing a, a home meeting, and I began to knock a preacher that has tens of thousands of people you may see him on TV. And I began to knock this preacher. And pretty soon I got a call from pastor, hey, why don't you come in my office? And he sat Danielle and I down and he said, you know, you, you were knocking this preacher and somebody in that group at your home, their dad got saved through their ministry. And here you are knocking that preacher. Danielle said we were stupid. That's right. Don't put your mouth on another man's ministry. Take it easy on pastors. Love pastors. Pray for them. If you have a problem with a pastor, I would encourage you to pray for them rather than talk about them. Be careful that you don't sow discord in the body of Christ. The Bible says that God hates when someone sows discord among the brethren. A little quiet. Maybe I touched on something there. <laughs> know what to preach next week. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, I'll move on. <laughs> Another thing that I've found that has kept people parallel. Well, let me let me let me just go back to that. I find I I meet Christians that that they say they don't trust pastors. Because maybe there was a few bad apples that you knew. Danielle and I, we have sought and, and tried to model our ministry after Pastor Butch and Miss Susan, married their whole life. There was never an episode. Jonathan Adalis Shuttlesworth, amazing ministers and ministries. Rodney Howard Brown, Adalis, his, his, Adalis, Adonica. His wife, you talk about ministries with integrity. Just personally, I'm not really going to follow, and, and nothing wrong if, if, if a minister has been divorced, but I, I'm just, you know, God bless them. Lord, use them to reach some other folks. But I want to I wanna come into partnership with ministries that they made it all the way to the end with their spouse. 
Billy Graham, Kenneth Hagin. We're, we're talking about giants who were faithful. They stood the test of time. Amen. You know, if, if I would have just hung out in my offense all those years ago, because I've been hurt too. But if I would have just stayed in that offense, I would have never been able to move forward in what God has called me to do. I've had plenty of opportunities to be offended with my pastors, with mentors. I had mentors on the mission field. One of them actually took one, the first church that we started. Just took it. We did. We just honored the Lord, and the church ended up coming back to us. They, they bowed out. I mean, they got into pride. They wanted all these missionaries on the, on the mission field, and, all, and it was like this competition thing. Danielle and I, we never wanted to compete. Oh, you're just going to come in and take it? All right, we'll let you have it. And the whole thing, everything that they were building, it all collapsed. And the church ended up coming back to us. With my own pastor, Pastor Butch, I remember we came home. This was after Malaysia. And Pastor Butch said, Jeremy, I want you to lead worship on Wednesday nights. I got up there. I started leading the first Wednesday night. And there was another worship leader who was the main worship leader who was in competition. I didn't really know. But apparently he pitched a fit. So pastor said, Jeremy, I want you to go play guitar. Go play electric guitar in the back. Yes, sir. Wasn't about me. If I would have acted out in that moment, it would have been all about me. I, I look at things as a test from the Lord. I looked at that as a test. I mean, it hurt my, my feet. I mean, pastor said this. Uh, I'm, I'm leading worship, and next thing you know, I'm in the back. I looked at that as a test from the Lord. I'm God's going to test you. And I just, I just bowed out. Ha happily, I'll, I'll happily play guitar in the back. It do doesn't matter. I, I just want to be a, a little part. That's all. I Father, I just want to serve you in whatever way. Amen. Amen. Because once, once you make this about you, and it, and it becomes a thing of entitlement, well, I've got a position. You know, that's why around here, I, I'm not just going to quickly put people into place. I'm going to test people's hearts. That's what Jesus did. That's what the Lord does. And I'm going to put people into position that have my heart. They have the heart of the pastor. And if you don't, I, I'm not going to promote you. Hallelujah. You know, people don't like spiritual authority. Sometimes people aren't team players. If you're going to be a part of something great, you have to learn how to be a team player. When Pastor Bush said, go to the back, I'm a team player. doesn't matter. You can put me anywhere on the field. Let me be the water boy. I don't even care. Because it's not about me. I know that the Lord, he's checking my heart right now. He's always checking. And so we were faithful with what God put in front of us. I didn't allow my heart to get offended. And you know what? In due time, God promoted us. He sent us to Cambodia. Where we started three churches. Hallelujah. By the grace of God. Yeah. How are we doing? 1154. Praise God. I can't trust the pastor. Well, then you'll never be able to move forward. That's right where the enemy wants you. You don't trust anybody. Do you not trust all dentists? How about doctors? Like, we know there's some bad apples there. But do you, do you not trust any doctors? 
You've written them all off? (laughs) Danielle's like, pretty much. After COVID, yes. How about electricians? Paul, you ever met an electrician that was like, oh, this dude's a little shady. And so now you don't trust any electricians. I don't trust any pastors. Well, the enemy has you right where he wants you. Because you'll never be able to grow. You'll never be able to thrive. You know, the enemy has been trying to take out this church ever since its conception. The enemy hates what's happening here. Hates the potential. So every time there's a swelling, all of a sudden he comes in to try to take it out. Well, I'm going to say this. I don't know how to quit. I don't know how to quit. I don't know how to stop moving forward. I, I, I don't know how to do God without being on fire for him. I, I don't know how to not give it 100%. I don't know how to do tradition and religion. I don't know how to do that. But the book of Acts, what I see modeled in the Gospels, that's all I know. And that's what I'm running after. I see a New Testament church here being formed. I see the fire of God consuming this place. And you know what? When the fire of God consumes a place, it's going to shake everything that can be shaken. It's going to bring out the good, the bad, and the ugly. My prayer is that everybody that's here would stay here. But the fire of God is going to awaken things. It's going to unearth attitudes and things that that either you're going to deal with or you're going to reject. When Saul in the Bible, when he encountered the Lord, he began to prophesy. Here's Saul, had never prophesied before. He's in the presence of God. The Spirit comes upon him, and he begins to prophesy. But as he walked out, how many of you know he needed the character? And so God began to test him immediately. He gave him instructions. I want you to do this. In fact, when when you go into this region, I want you to take everybody out, Saul. That's the instructions. But when he got there, what did he do? He disobeyed the Lord. He didn't take everybody out. And the prophet Samuel walks up and he says, what's this I hear? The bleeding of sheep. He was afraid of the people. And so it's one thing to encounter God. It's one thing to to go to a youth conference and get on fire. I felt the presence of God. But what do you do when you come out of that? I feel like there's a part two of this message because... I want to get to complaining, I want to get to fear, insecurity, and jealousy. You know, in Numbers, God had told Moses, you you send 12 spies into the land. 12 spies, they went into the land. They were supposed to report that it's as God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. When they came back, 10 of the spies said, yep, it's exactly what God said, but... They began to contradict what God had said. And they came and they complained against Moses and Aaron. Ten people talked all of the Israelites out of going into the promised land. They were the majority. They didn't heed the two, the minority, Caleb and Joshua. And for 40 years they missed out on the promised land. And when they complained against Moses, Pastor Moses, if you will, when the church complained, God said they complained against him. He took it personal. So if you speak and complain against leaders in the church, Jesus takes it personal.
Rodney said there were certain churches he wouldn't, he wouldn't go to. He said, if I come to your church and the fire of God hits, your church will fall apart because the people aren't ready. They're not ready to repent. You know, you can be a church that actually disappoints Jesus. You read the book of Revelation, the seven churches, like five of them got an F. One of them got a C, and one of them got an A. And so as much as we have a good time here in the presence of the Lord, I mean, we go after joy, we go after his presence, we laugh, we drink milk, we also eat steak because God wants us to mature. Jesus wants his church to mature. It's, it's when we begin to feast on these things that it brings maturity. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you've got some things to chew on. This may be, there may be a part two. But the Lord wants, he wants to set people free. Don't get stuck in paralyzed and offense. Don't get stuck in, I had, I had man, I'll tell you. Fear, insecurity. I mean, Saul, it, it, fear of man literally took him out. Saul died on his own sword. He took his own life because he never dealt with these things. There may be some things in you today that you haven't dealt with. The Lord's saying, I'm, I'm coming as a fire to burn that out of you. God has nothing but the best for you. And listen, over the years, Danielle and I, we've, we've made mistakes. I've, I've spoken when I shouldn't have spoken. But I've repented. I've, I've learned. I just need to be quiet. If I've got an issue with Pastor Butch and the way he does something, it's not me to address it. Right? I'm the disciple. He's the mentor. The student is not greater than the teacher. That's backwards. There's a system of spiritual authority. That's how churches op That's how the church operates. Amen. When you, when you look in, in Revelation, when Jesus was speaking to the church, who did he deal with? He dealt with the pastor. He said to, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, that word angel, it, it literally means pastor. They translated it wrong. It was a letter to the pastor of the church. The pastor is going to stand before Christ. And that, that's a scary, scary thing that I don't take lightly. There's been a shift that has happened here recently. There's been a shift. Spiritual authority, fire. God's wanting to deal with hearts. He's wanting to bring this church into a place of fulfilling what he has, his plans and his purposes, and you're a part of that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Heavenly Father, I, I pray for those that are in this room today. Lord, if there's anything in the hearts of your people that needs to be addressed, Lord, we don't want to wait till we get to heaven to deal with those things. Maybe there's some things in the hearts of your people today that we haven't yet repented of. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's, it's offense, being offended. Maybe it's complaining. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's unbelief, the fear of man. Father, I pray that you would deal with hearts today. Deal with hearts. Today is a new day. We don't have to be stuck. We don't have to be paralyzed by those things. 
I declare over your people today, in the name of Jesus, whatever has paralyzed you, caused you to be immobile, in the name of Jesus, I command you to rise up and walk. To rise up and walk. I thank you, Lord, that those of this house, with this stream of teaching and revelation and the flow of the Spirit, that they will walk, leap, and praise God. I thank you for total victory, that no one settles for anything but absolute victory. In Jesus' name. Father, even as we prayed on Friday night, Lord, I pray for a grace to deal with these things. Lord, we, we know that you're, you are a gentleman, that you're a father, and that you send your Holy Spirit to come and address things that are in our hearts. Pray that you prepare hearts. Prepare the hearts of your people. That you would transform us from the inside out. Lord, I pray that the words that I spoke today would penetrate the hearts and spirits of your people. That it would take an 18-inch journey from the mind all the way to the heart. And that they would be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey there, I want to personally invite you to prayerfully consider partnering with this ministry. If these teachings have been a blessing to you and stirred you up, then I want to encourage you to jump on board and become a weekly or monthly supporter. To support Revival Missions, simply go to our website at jeremyfontenot.com. The link will be posted in the description and there you'll find several ways to give. You can give via PayPal, via tithe.ly, or you can send an old-fashioned check in the mail. And uh, I want to say thank you in advance for partnering with us to see the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Be sure to check out some of our other content, and we'll see you on the next video.